We are going to move on to our first um, external contributor talk uh, of uh, this Flower Monthly. I'm uh, really delighted uh, to say that we have finally got excellent iOS support in um, Flower. And what's also really uh, amazing about this is that this is an external project. Um, so Maximilian and um, a few other people there at the Technical Un uh, University of Munich uh, wanted to see this happen. I know they've been working a lot with another core member of Flower, Charles, who you've seen in other Flower monthlies. Um, and then these folks have just run ahead with this project. And um, I'm amazed at how far and how, how great this is. So um, so thank you, Maximilian, for your contribution to Flower. And it's great to, great to chat to you today. Now this should be my presentation, hopefully in good resolution, Sampa. It looks great. I love okay. the color. So thank you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I, I try to, to stay in uh, corporate identity with, with the flower team. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, once again, uh, thank you, Nick, for the introduction. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to this presentation on uh, FlyOS, that is Federated Learning Meets iOS or um, Flower Meets iOS. Uh, my name is Max, and I'm thrilled to introduce uh, a Swift SDK that brings the power and benefits of federated learning to the iOS world. Um, as machine learning and privacy become simultaneously more important in our world, it's relevant that developers can conveniently and easily take advantage of federated learning on iOS devices. So during this session, we'll dive into some of the details of the recently merged pull request, and we'll also provide you with uh, a sample to demonstrate how easy it is to get started and to verify also our implementation. So uh, let's start with some motivation for extending Flower towards uh, the Swift SDK. So uh, Swift is the core programming language of iOS. This makes it a critical language for developers looking to create mobile applications for iOS devices. According to a study by Statista, iOS has a coverage of 27.7%, making it the second largest mobile operating system after Android, um, which, by the way, has a, a coverage in the population of approximately 70%. Another reason for us to extend Flower towards uh, the Swift SDK is the availability of HealthKit. HealthKit is a framework provided by Apple uh, that allows developers to access and share health-related data between different applications. Uh, with HealthKit, uh, developers can access a rich source of health-related data that can be used to develop innovative healthcare applications, and it can be the foundation for several interesting machine learning use cases. Lastly, CoreML, Apple's on-device machine learning library, is a powerful tool that enables on-device optimization routines in an efficient manner as it runs natively on Apple's hardware. This means that developers can build machine learning models that run directly on iOS devices, resulting in uh, rather fast and efficient predictions. This is a critical tool for developers looking to build sophisticated applications that rely on uh, yeah, um, convenient uh, machine learning uh, for the uh, Apple ecosystem. So let's have a look at the architecture of the SDK. And um, for that, we like to give you uh, the top level design of a software system that utilizes the uh, Flora Swift SDK. Uh, the software follows our server client architecture. This means that the client application will communicate with a server in order to execute its task. The client application include, includes the Flower Swift SDK as a package. This package consists of two subsystems, communication and machine learning. The machine learning subsystem provides core ML routines, which include data preparation, fitting, and evaluating the on-device machine learning model. With this subsystem, developers can integrate machine learning models directly into their iOS application, given some restrictions that we detail later. The SDK provides, furthermore, the serialization and deserialization of data structures between these two subsystems. This includes transforming uh, uh, formats such as protobuf, numpy, and Swift arrays, allowing for data exchange, exchange between the systems. The communication subsystem enables client-server communication via gRPC, allowing the server to send instructions to the client and enabling the client to respond with the respective answers. As a naming convention, um, and by the way, this follows the given flower implementation, all data structs uh, that include instructions are denoted with an ins at the end, while all responses are denoted with an res at the end. So that's why those three beginning letters are written in bold. 
Considering a high-level representation of the information flow, the, inf the communication for the core process looks like this, and this might be already familiar to you, but um, sorry for um, repeating it maybe. Um, so uh, the server initiates a communication by sending a get parameters ins request to the client. It requests the client to return the current model parameters, which are returned in the get parameters rest structure. In the current implementation, the server does this to capture an initial version of the model's weights, but note that this uh, it, it is usually not uncommon for the server to initiate the model's weights on its own. Once the minimum number of required devices is reached, the server sends the fit-ins message. It instructs the participating clients to inject the global model, model parameters attached to the fit-ins message and start the local optimization. The server, in turn, expects the fitted model parameter fit res as the result. After the model has been locally optimized and the server has, has received this result, the evaluate ins message requests client to inject a test set and return the resulting evalu evaluate res structure, which contains information such as loss or accuracy. On behalf of the server, a reconnect ins command can be sent to request the client to reconnect to the server or on the client side, on the other hand, the communication can be terminated at any given time. So let's assume you're building an iOS application of version 14 and higher, and you've already managed to integrate the Flower SDK to your Xcode project. How can you use it in your implementation? Therefore, we'll have a look at the following code snippet. First, at the top of your file is the import of the Flower package. Then you can write custom code such as code maps, such as code that maps the domain logic, loads data, or defines the machine learning model. If you want to instantiate the um, ML Flower client, which is connected to the machine learning subsystem, you need three variables. The variable layer wrapper from the ML layer wrapper class contains a reference to the structure of the model and the associated weights. The second variable, data loader of type uh, ML data loader, stores the information about train and test batches. Batches have the great advantage of optimizing performance, for instance, in case of asynchronous data loading or memory intensive da uh, data loading. Finally, uh, the uh, compiled model URL, uh, so the, the last argument here um, of type URL, points to the path of the compiled machine learning model in the uh, file system of your Xcode project. The second required instance is of type Flower gRPC. It instantiates the class that enables communication between the client and the server. Therefore, it takes the hostname and port of the server as arguments. As a final implementation step, you need to start the connection by passing the ML Flower client. Note that you also need to provide a completion handler that is the behavior upon completion of the federated learning process. Here, for instance, we um, just said, okay, once the process is finished, um, uh, log.info, so just a logging shall happen to the console. However, the implementation only provides a standard machine learning client. More specifically, that means the ML Flower client is limited to dense and convolutional layers only by now and supports only the core ML as a framework. But for special needs, such as using TensorFlow Lite, you can write your own ML client by implementing the SDK's abstract client protocol. It requires the implementation of four predefined function bodies. These are a function that returns the parameters of the model, a function that returns the properties of the model, a function that applies the fitting command and return the respective results, and a function that does the same for the evaluate model task. Okay, um, what does this look like in practice? For this purpose, we have included the SDK in an iOS benchmark application. Um, you can find the example at the link provided on the slide here uh, on the bottom. It contains uh, the um, well-known MNIST benchmark scenario that we will now present uh, in a demonstration. And I hope uh, this runs smoothly um, because we've never tested it before um, with the frames per seconds and so on. What we have here uh, on the left-hand side is actually um, just um, a terminal where I can start the server and um, lock the, the server output. 
And then I have here three iPhone 13 Bros. So we have some uh, iPhones at our um, university. So that was also kind of the reason we were going for um, the um, iOS uh, ecosystem. And um, so maybe I start with um, yeah, starting the server. And um, what I um, hand over is the minimum number of required clients is free. And we want to run um, each round or in, in, uh, all together, we want to run it for three rounds. So th th these are the arguments I'm um, handing over to the server by now. And um, with that, I'm starting it. So take some time. Maybe it's already running for a while. The terminal, ah, no, no, now it started. And um, no, now I'm switching over to um, the my, my client application. So within this uh, benchmark iOS application, we included the SDK and, and it works perfectly fine in, in the backend. And what I'm doing first, um, so as I said, um, we're running the MNIST benchmark scenario, but we're not loading 60K images, which would be the usual size of the train data set. Um, but we limited it to uh, 10,000 um, images. So it doesn't make a huge difference in timing, but for the sake of the demonstration, um, waiting for like a minute would be kind of awkward silence. So for that reason, we restricted it to 10,000 images. So I'm pressing here on, and by the way, what I'm doing now would usually be done in the background of an application, but um, for demonstration purposes, we're doing that step by step. So first of all, we want to prepare our data set. So that means uh, the app uh, loads from a CSV file um, in the back end, the um, 10,000 um, uh, images, the 28 by 28 grayscale um, images. And um, so we do with the test data set. So now uh, all of them uh, are loaded. Um, I could also prepare a local client. So the um, idea behind the local client is just if I want to test without any federated learning um, how um, machine learning behaves on an iOS um, device, I can test it here, for instance, um, setting it uh, the, 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 the epochs to two and uh, running the training. As you see, it, it's, it's, it runs quite fast and um, I also can um, do inference on the test set and receive um, the respective um, loss for that. Um, but more interestingly, uh, here below, um, we can prepare our federated uh, client. So at the time I click at start here, um, the code snippet I just have shown to you is executed. Um, furthermore, what I have to um, provide is the server host name. So um, we made a secure text field out of it. So um, that no one can see my IP address and um, the um, server port is, is 8080, so nothing, nothing crucial here. And um, let me start. Um, I have to grant access to the network because it's a, we just installed it. Uh, so I have to uh, grant access uh, to the network. And um, the same I do for the second device. And um, usually you can see here on the left-hand side and um, nothing happens because we haven't reached three devices um, by now. At least it, nothing should happen or nothing should change. And once um, we also start for the third uh, device, um, the server starts um, also um, responding. So it says uh, it has uh, sampled three clients out of three. And um, the process, um, as you know from uh, also the, the, the Python implementation, um, starts. So, um, and now um, the, the, the information flow that I've shown uh, previously, like um, sending out the fit um, ins uh, message and re receiving the fit res uh, message um, that is now started um, for three rounds. So um, we have to wait for that. Ah, now it has finished. Um, it returns here um, for the different devices, also the losses, so they're quite low. Um, so might be that the network is, is quite large for 10,000 images and therefore we tend to also have kind of an overfitting, but um, accuracy shall not be the, the, the main topic here, but just for um, demonstrating you that it works. Um, this was um, our uh, demonstration on that. Um, what you also can do um, within this application, and um, so did we um, with um, at least uh, 16 iOS devices lately, we run some performance analysis, which we also want to uh, publish in an art article. 
which further demonstrates um, how, how well this works. But um, if you're interested in um, how much battery consumption is behind that, um, what was uh, the network traffic uh, and what was the accuracy, you have here uh, on the uh, very bottom um, a benchmark tab where you can actually import um, those metric metrics and, and share it, um, for instance, um, with your um, with your computer. It's in JSON format, so you can do analysis on it. Um, if you are interested more into that and what you can analyze with it, um, I'm happy to, to answer your questions uh, later on on that. So um, what is our uh, conclusion? Um, as I just said, we even performed a larger performance analysis with 16 iOS devices to measure uh, the battery, network communication, and timing for different scenarios, like we simulated dropping or joining of devices, like um, we had, first of all, um, we said uh, the, the, the minimum threshold are 10 devices, and um, we started with 12 devices, and um, by time, um, or for each epoch, we dropped some devices, and once um, they, um, the, the minimum number of devices were, um, were not met anymore, um, the process stopped as um, um, expected. Of course, there are implementation challenges that hold some interesting tasks for the future. So um, for security reasons, iOS is quite restrictive when it comes to background threats. While there are options for scheduling tasks and the implementation, they do not address the desire to run federated learning as a full background process. Um, the SDK does not include adversarial attack prevention technology by now, such as secure aggregation or differential privacy. Um, furthermore, um, during the benchmarks experiment, we saw that older devices with lower capacity tend to lose battery power quickly. So uh, mechanisms are needed that can distribute a load of training or even exclude devices that are not powerful enough to perform on-device optimization. Um, yeah, um, there's also the possibility to extend the benchmark application with more scenarios like um, the c 10 data set and to make the process more vivid on the device by showing the current incoming and outcoming, outgoing messages. And um, yeah, personally, my plans are to include variational autoencoders into the mobile federated learning context, um, specifically as autoencoders seem to be an appropriate access for um, unsupervised federated learning. And with all the data stored in HealthKit, we have several ideas to explore here. Yeah, at this point, I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Daniel and Christoph, that contributed to the project as well. Um, feel free to reach out to us um, if you have any further questions. And with this, thank you for joining today in this presentation. I hope that you have found the information presented to be helpful. And if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to ask on uh, Slack um, or um, drop us an email. Thank you so much. This is an amazing contribution. Um, and I really appreciate the way you presented it today too. It's it so clear that you've had this um, this visual visual um, live view of the actual phones. You're a very brave man, I must say, just running three phones. And I think I saw an iPad there all working yeah. together. And, and you, it was not a, a, a you know a canned um, demonstration. It's a real in front of us demonstration live. So that's uh, that was brilliant. Um, Thank and you. I mean, and furthermore, I mean, I, I can't wait to see what the cloud community is going to build on top of this SDK because once you can start having clients and nodes on your um, on iOS class devices, uh, you know, the, the world's your oyster about what you can build in terms of federated uh, learning using that platform. So amazing. Um, Thank you. Appreciate your words. Yeah, great. I'm sure people are going to engage with you on on Slack and, and, and following up uh, with you on this, this contribution. So th thank you so much today. I really appreciate it.